Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce our today's speaker, uh, Professor Mark Muller. Mark is a uh, professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at UC Berkeley. He did his undergraduate from University of Pretoria and Masters from Ithia Zurich, and also I think uh, <coughs> the PhD also from Ithia Zurich from Institute for Dynamic Systems and Control. So he works in aerial robotics. So and. Uh, We'll be talking about all the exciting research he's doing in his group at High Performance Robotics Lab at UC Berkeley. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Abhishek. Uh, yeah, so we're a relatively small group, I guess. So if you have questions, feel free to interrupt. Uh, if you have a question, it's a large fraction of the audience uh, that wants to ask it, so that's good. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, I want to talk a little bit generally about our research. Um, I don't think this is the title that I promised. I'm sorry about that. So I think I, I had an impromptu talk and I changed the title and I didn't realize it. Um, anyway, so we're interested in, in small aerial robotics, uh, and of course, you know, these things are interesting for a couple of reasons. The main reason is that with a small aerial robot, you have effectively an unbounded workspace, right? So you can go uh, easily in many places, and in some sense, it's really easy to operate uh, small aerial robots, much easier than other types of robots. And the reason for this is, uh, one, the world is much emptier in 3D than in 2D. So if you think of moving a ground robot from one side of the hole to the other side, that's a relatively difficult planning problem. But once you're able to fly, it's very straightforward, right? You just go up two meters and you have a straight line. The other reason is that it's, in some sense, easier to fly than to do other things. Easier in the sense that it's easier to model. So the physics of flight are very well understood. And usually we can treat these aerial robots, drones, etc., as rigid bodies. So you have very compact, well-described mathematics uh, predicting the behavior. And if you compare this to something that drives on the ground, uh, where you have contact mechanics, it's much harder to predict and it's much harder to model accurately. Of course, there are downsides to flight. You know, the main disadvantage is that you pay for mass in terms of range and, um, I guess, uh, the danger of the system. So you typically have fewer uh, sensors than you would like. You have less actuation than you would like. You have a, a smaller range than you would like. Um, and also, these vehicles are inherently dangerous. So whenever you're flying, you always have some amount of potential energy that you're carrying with you. And if you compare this to something that drives, for example, there's no obvious way uh, to have a safe action in all conditions. So if you're driving and your sensors fail, your estimator you know, crashes, something like this, you can just sort of step on the brakes. But once you're in the air, it's unclear what a safe action is if your sensors have failed or if your estimator resets. Um, and finally, it's very hard to interact with the environment uh, when you're flying. If you want to open a door, if you have a ground robot, that's very easy somehow. If you have a flying robot, that's very, very difficult. Of course, these you know, robots are moving into applications more and more. So uh, I guess the, the most high point is sort of the delivery business. Um, you know, Amazon, DHL, I was speaking to a Chinese company with 19 million food deliveries per day. They're interested in using drones to deliver some fraction of that. Uh, and you can imagine here there's a big market for uh, having these, these systems operating. Precision agriculture is another big one. Um, where you could imagine having effectively a small satellite that you can send out of your farm uh, and that can then look underneath clouds uh, and other things like this. Uh, and then two other applications, of course, personal you know, hobby uh, drones, this is DJI drone, and then the last one here, which I'll show a video of in a bit, uh, is to use these things as props effectively to create special effects. Uh, so this is a stage actor interacting with some drones as part of an art performance. And each of these cases, it's clear that the value of the system is inherently tied to its autonomy. So you can't have a pilot per drone in any of these applications because then suddenly it no longer is uh, interesting uh, from a commercial perspective. So I want to talk about uh, a couple of aspects of autonomy that we are looking at. The first is some trajectory generation work. This is some older work we've done. Um, where we're trying to think about how do you move these drones from one point in the world to another point. And the goal really is to exploit uh, the dynamics and to be fast. And what I mean by fast is uh, fast in the sense of these vehicles are very agile and you want to use this agility, you want to exploit the agility. Uh, so you want to have trajectories that somehow push you close to what is possible. And at the same time, you want to be fast computationally so that you can react to things in real time, right? So you want to be able to react to dynamic circumstances uh, and plan online. And when I say fast, uh, the number is specifically something like a million trajectories per second on a computer, and I'll give you an example of where something like this would be useful, right? So where uh, this extreme computational uh, cheapness is useful. Uh, 
Now, specifically, the problem we are solving is trying to move a vehicle from a given state to another state in a fixed time, right? So this is a very particular type of trajectory generation problem. Um, okay, so I said that uh, you know these systems are nice because their dynamics is very simple. So you know, quadcopter, as the name suggests, four propellers, uh, two propellers rotating in one sense, two propellers rotating in the opposite sense. Of course, going around. Uh, each propeller produces a force that's perpendicular to its axis, well, to its plane of rotation, uh, and this force is related to the speed of the propeller. So as the propeller rotates, it uses the force, and it produces a torque that opposes the rotation. Right? So as the propeller pushes the air down, the air pushes back. There's also a torque from the propeller's force acting at a distance from the center of the mass. Now, if you want to write down the dynamics, you'd start with the uh, translational dynamics, so you have the linear acceleration of the vehicle, as a function of the forces that the propellers produce, F1 through F4 in this case. R is the rotation matrix that describes the orientation of the vehicle, and then there's the weight of the vehicle moving down to the ground. The rotation matrix evolves according to a relatively simple differential equation itself, where PQ and R are the three components of angular velocity. So the, the roll rate around the x-axis, P, the pitch rate around the y-axis, Q, and then the yaw rate around the z-axis, R. And this is just this skew symmetric matrix, the cross product effectively. Uh, and then the angle equation is for the angular dynamics of these vehicles, right? So angular dynamics are always nastier than translational dynamics. So this is the change in angular momentum of the vehicle, uh, where you have the mass moment inertia of the vehicle, the angular acceleration of the vehicle, you have the angular acceleration of the propellers, so this is the change in momentum of the propellers. You have the torques acting on the vehicle right at the end. Uh, which consists of the propeller forces acting at a distance from the center of mass, that's this one here. Then there's some torque due to the rotation of the propeller, and there might be other environmental torques acting. Uh, and then finally, there's this ugly cross product term here, omega cross i omega. That's because we're taking uh, time derivatives in a non inertial frame, so you get this nasty term here. And in that few dynamics, there's no real way to get uh, around that. Um, so when we talk about trajectory generation, of course, the goal is to come up with inputs. So that would be uh, functions for these forces, F1 through F4, that take the system from some initial state in a given time to some final state. And the problem is these need to satisfy these ugly uh, equations that we have here. Specifically, the attitude equations are very difficult uh, to, to deal with. So the way that you can get rid of this difficulty in, in dealing with this nonlinear equation for the attitude dynamics is basically to ignore it. Uh, and what we'll do, and I'll explain why this is possible, but let me first sort of summarize what, what you do typically when you're trying to plan this trajectory. So you treat, instead of the four forces as inputs, you treat the three components of angular velocity, so PQR, the raw rate, pitch rate, and yaw rate, uh, as three inputs, and then the total force, which we call C, as a total input. Um, and if you do this, you have very compact and much nicer, still nonlinear, but much nicer differential equations for the system. Now, of course, in reality, PQR are not inputs. These are continuous things, right? They must satisfy different equations of their own. But the vehicles have forces that are at the extremes of their uh, bodies. So the force is very far from the center of mass. And they have relatively low mass moments of inertia. So when you combine these two things, uh, you get that these vehicles can produce very large angular accelerations. And what that means is that the angular velocity uh, can respond much faster than any other dynamic in the system, and you can effectively do a time scale separation at the angular velocity for these vehicles. And if you do that, you can have a low-level controller that tracks the angular velocity, and you have the high-level trajectory generator which pretends that these uh, angular velocity range. So if you do this, you have much nicer differential equation, and on these differential equations, you can have a much simpler uh, plan trajectories. And specifically, what you would do is you exploit the fact that these are differentially flat um, to compute trajectories. I'm not going to go into too much detail there, um, but if you do this uh, specifically to get the speed that we want, we do a two-step uh, generation approach, where in the first step, we generate a trajectory ignoring the constraints. So constraints that act in the system would be input constraints, so maximum forces that you can produce, for example, and state constraints that you don't collide with anything in the environment, for example. Uh, so we generate first a motion that does not care about the constraint, and in the second step, we check this motion for feasibility. And this is sort of a different way from what you would typically do if you think of typical NPC approaches. You do this in one sort of combined loop. Now we separate this into two separate parts, and what this does is it gives us a much faster way of generating trajectories. And this is useful if you have problems that have 
significant freedom in how you execute uh, or what you do in the problem. I want to give you an example of where this is particularly useful. So the problem that we explored for this is uh, that of trying to strike a ball with quadcopter. So what we do is we take a quadcopter, you attach a, a badminton racket head to the vehicle, so just rigidly strap it down. And then you have a ball that you throw, and the quadcopter's task is to try to strike this ball so that it returns to where it came from. This is obviously a very artificial problem. No one has this in real life. Uh, but it's related to some things that you would have in real life. So if you imagine landing on a platform, it's very similar to this problem. You need to reach a certain state. Uh, and what's nice about this problem is a few things. So first of all, it's a very intuitive problem. So we all have some intuition for how you know, striking the ball works. Uh, it's a very real-time problem, so you can't pre-plan anything. You have to respond in real time because you don't know where this ball is going to go before you throw it. Uh, and three, it's sort of very uh, dynamic, right? So it's, it requires some agility. And if you think about it, there's a lot of freedom in how you execute this. So if I want to strike a ball, uh, let's imagine this ball moving along this trajectory here. I can strike the ball at any point along its path uh, and still achieve the mission, right? And I can hit the ball with very much of energy. This is what this cartoon is supposed to demonstrate. So if I hit the ball at a certain point, I can hit it hard so it goes high, or I can sort of hit it with less energy so it has a very low trajectory towards the top. And this freedom in executing the, the mission is what will allow us to exploit the speed, right? So because we are so fast, we can effectively do a brute force search over these parameters. And the way we do this is we run a controller at 50 hertz, so it's a 20 millisecond period. And every 20 millisecond, we evaluate 10,000 approximately candidates that would strike the ball towards the target. Uh, of these, we reject the ones that would be infeasible, uh, either because of their inputs or because they would collide with the environment. Uh, of the remainder, we choose that trajectory which is the least aggressive, executes 20 milliseconds worth of its inputs. 20 milliseconds later, we repeat the process. So it gives you sort of a, a model predictive control framework uh, to do this. Uh, and what it allows you to do is it allows you to search over a very non-convex, sort of arbitrary search space because you have this scene. And what does this look like? So this is just showing in real time uh, the ball being thrown and then struck back towards where it came from. So maybe the sound will work, but you can try. Uh, okay, so you see the ball uh, flying. This is the, all the time you have, right? So as the ball is flying, you need to predict where it's going to go and then respond. So it's happening in the background. So this is a freeze frame. So we see um, the video frozen, and then we predict where the ball is going to go over time. So that's what you see moving here. And these are five different candidate trajectories that move the quad copy from its current state uh, to different intercept points along the ball's trajectory. All five have the same amount of energy that we wish to impart to the ball in the sense that the ball should go to the same maximum height. Right? And you can see that if you want to hit the ball early on, I need to move very quickly while the later on these are really slow today. And now I can search over multiple de degrees of freedom. So I can search over how high the ball has to go, I can search over at which point I wish to strike the ball. Uh, and what we did at this particular instant in time is we evaluated about 11,000 trajectories. So what you see here is 10% of these trajectories um, that strike the ball and turn it to time. And the red trajectory here is that one which we deemed optimal, right? So it's the one that has the least aggressive inputs and is the most uh, and is feasible. And then we execute 20 milliseconds worth of this trajectory, and then 20 milliseconds later we repeat this entire process. And when you do this, you get a closed loop controller uh, that's capable of rejecting disturbances acting on the ball and on the quadcopter in the same loop as executing this control stream. So what you see here, I'm going to let this play again, is in real time just the optimal trajectory that the vehicle is following. So just the single set uh, optimal of which is executing the first 20 milliseconds worth of motion. And you see how this is updated in real time. So you see that this changes as we get more information about where the ball is, uh, more information about the quad cost, and of course the disturbance is active. Okay, so something that I didn't really talk about, but maybe let me explain. Um, the architecture design in the background. So a million trajectories per second, that doesn't mean very much if you don't know where we're running this. So that's my single core laptop. If you ran this on the microcontroller on the vehicle, it's about a factor of 100 slower, so you have 10,000 per second, uh, which is still substantial. So here, instead of 10,000 trajectories, every loop you could get maybe 100. Uh, but 100 is still a reasonable number to cover a search space. And what this gives us is gives us a very powerful way to execute searches through sort of non-convex, ugly problems that you might want to solve. 
clearly this is unlikely to be valuable to anyone uh, in the near future, but if you're imagining a drone delivering a package for Amazon uh, flying over your house, uh, something, some obstacle appears in the way, it could be a bird, it could be your house, uh, avoiding this obstacle is in some sense a similar problem, right? So there's many different ways that you could uh, fly to avoid the obstacle, and this is a very non-convex space. And the computational efficiency that something like this offers you uh, gives you the possibility to sort of explore the space. You have very few guarantees about completeness, obviously, because you have this sample-based approach, but because of the uh, large number that you can sample, you have reasonable confidence that if there is a solution, you're likely to find it as well. Okay, now I'm talking about robustness uh, of these vehicles, right? So if you think about them flying over your house, it's important that they're able to avoid obstacles, but you also worry about other problems that they might experience. And one of the main ones is, you know, failure of components. And why would components fail? Well, here in the U.S., we sort of worry about things like this. Um, so, of course, you know, it need not be as dramatic as this. You can imagine a collision with an obstacle, for example. Uh, and this causes one of your actuators to fail, right? So the big selling point of these multicopters is their mechanical simplicity. But, of course, mechanical simplicity has a downside as well. So if I have four propellers and I lose one of these propellers, it seems like I'm likely to uh, have a catastrophic failure. Now, the typical engineering solution to this problem is redundancy. So here you see a progression from four propellers to sort of a cheap consumer drone, six, eight propellers for the Amazon delivery drone, one of their mock-ups at least, uh, to this human carrying drone that has 16 propellers. And the logic is simple. The more, you know, the more propellers I have, the less I care about a single one failing. Right? So if I have 16 propellers and one fails, that's kind of negligible. If I have a quarter of my propellers fails, that matters. But this comes with a downside, because each additional propeller requires additional structural mass, and I don't get much for the structural mass that I need to add, right? So this arm that I need to add here doesn't give me much uh, besides this imbalance. So we investigated this question of, can you fly with fewer components? So can you somehow make these systems fly with fewer components? Uh, and the advantages would be it could be cheaper, it would require less structure, and there's a conversion statement, but I would claim that it also actually lowers the probability of a failure happening. So if I have only four components to maintain, that's much easier to do well than if I have 16 components to maintain. Uh, so the question is, can you hover with fewer than four propellers? Um, the answer, of course, is yes, but let me qualify that. So why is this interesting? Why is this not obvious, perhaps? Uh, so if I have four propellers, as we saw, um, I can use the four forces to produce a total force and three components of torque. And I can choose these four numbers independently, right? So if you give me a desired total force and a desired torque vector in 3D, I can give you the forces that make this happen. And importantly, I can produce a zero torque while balancing the weight of the gear. Now, if I take one of these propellers away, this is no longer possible. So if you imagine this thing here, if I want to carry the weight, there's always going to be some torque imbalance, uh, no matter what I do with this. So the key idea is, yes, I can hover the vehicle as long as I allow it to rotate. Right? So that's sort of the key simplification uh, that you require. And since you don't have the mechanical engineering department, I'm going to take great joy in sharing these equations here. Um, so we investigated this for very arbitrary designs, uh, but we restrict ourselves to vehicles that have thrusts pointing in the same direction. So if you have something where the thrust vector points in sort of different directions, maybe not clear exactly what the answer is, but if you have any kind of vehicle where you have some arbitrary number of propellers that all point in the same direction, so all of these have a parallel thrust direction, they can rotate with different handedness, uh, but they must be parallel. In this case, you can write down the dynamics equation. These are exactly the same as we had with the quadcopter, except now, of course, you have sort of some arbitrary number of propellers that you need to sum over. Um, and they so I said, yes, you can hover. So uh, implicit in that is that I redefine hover to be more convenient for what I want to do. Usually when we think about hover, we think of something that's standing still uh, in the world. What we are going to allow, we're going to allow this vehicle to move, but it has to, on average, stay in the same position. So that translational acceleration has to be uh, zero on average. And from the vehicle's perspective, everything has to be constant. So the inputs, the motor forces, the angular velocity has to be constant. And if it's not at the position it's supposed to be, the error is constant from the vehicle's perspective. Right? So from the vehicle's perspective, everything <coughs> is constant. And if you apply this to those equations, you basically set the translational acceleration integrated over some time t to 0. And the angular acceleration you set to 0, you get this. Uh, these are a set of six 
ugly nonlinear coupled equations, algebraic, uh, but we can solve them. And you find that all solutions have the same property. So you are always either traditional hover or you're rotating. And if you're rotating, you're rotating around the gravity vector. So you're either rotating up or down, but always around the gravity vector. And your position trajectory is either static or it's a horizontal circle, right? So you're moving on a horizontal circle. And the way to imagine it is from the vehicle's perspective, it's sort of rotating around a point uh, in the world, and it's always looking at the point in the same uh, view. So what does this look like for a quadcopter? So if you have the quadcopters that we used in the lab for these experiments, they weigh about half a kilogram, so five newton uh, weight. If I have four propellers, each propeller produces 1.2 newtons of thrust, right? So this is a classical hover solution. Once I start removing propellers, this changes. So if I have three propellers, the force required goes up. So now these two need to produce about two newtons of force. And the vehicle has to be rotating. So this rotates at something like 18 radians per second, which is something like three hertz. If I remove another propeller, the forces go up yet again, kind of as you expect. Uh, and the velocity goes up. So now the vehicle rotates at 30 radians per second, which is something like 5 hertz. So it turns out that there is an equilibrium solution for each of these cases. There's also equilibrium solutions for the cases that I'm not showing, for two adjacent propellers out or three propellers out, but those we can't recreate in experiments, so I'm not showing them. So these we can all do in experiments. And of course, it's only the first part of the problem is finding an equilibrium. Next, we need to find that the system is controllable about this equilibrium. Uh, and why is this interesting? Well, if you look at this case, we only have two propellers. Uh, it's clear that I can produce torque around the axis bisecting the two propellers, right? So the difference in forces will produce torque around this axis. I can produce a torque around the thrust axis as well. So each propeller is producing counter torque. This is all pointing in an upward direction. But there's no way to produce a torque around the axis that connects the motors, right? So there is just no input uh, available here. So you cannot directly affect the vehicle's roll rate. But it turns out you can still control the roll rate by exploiting the attitude dynamics, and especially this cross coupling term here, omega cross i omega. And what you're doing is you're exploiting the fact that since both propellers are taking the same direction, the vehicle is going to rotate in the opposite direction. So you'll have a large angular velocity in the body's z direction. And with the one torque that you have available to you, you can produce an angular acceleration and an angular velocity around the body's two direction. And then omega cross i omega means that these two will interact to create an angular acceleration in the linearly independent direction. So you'll get some angular acceleration in the third direction. So effectively, by having the vehicle rotate, you're introducing an additional integrator into the dynamics that are not there uh, when you're not rotating. So when you linearize the system, so just to show you what the math looks like, so in a very simplified sense, you can look at only the subsystem that controls where the thrust vector is pointing. Uh, and this you can describe using four states. So there will be two components of angular velocity, the roll rate and the pitch rate, so the two components of angular velocity here. And two components of the unit vector that describes where the thrust is pointing, so in X and Y. And in the simplified world, your input would be the difference between the two motor forces or effectively the torque that you're applying around the axis. And the linearized dynamics then look as follows. Um, and what's nice here is that the A matrix is very sparse, right? And there's lots of zeros and ones. Uh, and only two interesting numbers. R bar is the steady state speed with which you're rotating about the thrust direction. And A bar is this pretty complicated, ugly expression that's a function of the mass of the inertia of the body, the speed with which you are rotating, the mass of the inertia of the propellers, and the speed with which the propellers are rotating. But this is a very simple equation. So what it allows us to do is allows us to do two things. First, it allows us to analyze under which conditions can you actually control this system. And there are two interesting cases where you cannot uh, control the system. The first case is if your mass distribution is like a sphere. So if you have a, uh, uh, a mass of inertia matrix that's the identity scale, what happens is the cross coupling disappears. And there's no way for you to use uh, these two components of angular velocity to produce angular acceleration on the third term, and you cannot control the system. The second slightly less intuitive case is if your system looks like a pancake, so if it's two-dimensional and you have that the inertia around Z is exactly equal to twice the inertia around X or Y. What happens is the system is also uncontrollable. It's slightly less obvious why that is the case, but it is the case. And what this sort of tells you is if you're designing a quad couple and you want to be able to use this mode, you want to put your mass in such a way that you're somewhere between these two extremes, right? So that you're not uh, like a sphere, but more are you like a pancake. And of course, the second thing you can do now is you can use your favorite linear control system uh, design to control this 
system. And what we did is we used these equations uh, and designed an LTI on top. Right, so one of the advantages of the way we define hover is that everything turns out to be LTI. And once it's LTI, or at least time invariant, once it's time invariant, you can linearize uh, and you have very powerful tools to, to do things with. Now I want to show you what this looks like when you actually use it. So this is a quadcopter taking off. And what you're looking at this camera is looking out to the right hand side of the So this is on board the vehicle and it's looking out and it's looking to the the map that you hold this to kind of down. And as we're flying, the vibration is towards this And clearly, once the propeller has failed, there's no longer any force there. So we've now gone from the force to the force to the And specifically here, the system uh, detects this failure and then switches into this alternative mode of control. And this is the same thing as looking from the top. So this is the propeller that fails. Once it fails, the vehicle starts to hold up the angular momentum and starts to build this rotation in motion. Uh, once it has sufficient angular momentum, it can use this control strategy to bring it back uh, to the screen. And then you can safely hover back when you start. So clearly this sort of suggests that the uh, you know, quadcopter design is in fact a redundant design. So you can fly even if you lose one of your four motors. We then push this further. So we start thinking, well, what is the simplest design that you can make? So starting with quadcopter, we built the three propeller vehicle. This is kind of boring, nothing exciting there. Uh, we built the stick light vehicle, about which I want to talk for a moment. And then we also built the single propeller vehicle. Uh, so the first one is this stick-like vehicle. What this is, is a quadcopter where we just chopped off two of the arms. So very stupid mechanical design. Um, and we naively thought that we can fly a quadcopter with two propellers easily. So this should be the same uh, easy thing to do. But it turned out to be very Now this was when it worked. Uh, usually the experiments don't work. And okay, so this is a bit embarrassing, but I think it's good to highlight this uh, because you know, maybe you don't hear enough about it in your undergraduate classes, or at least I didn't. Um, we have these very powerful uh, computational tools to compute LKR controllers for ground. And we use that here. You punch in the magic numbers, the inertia matrix, and out would come a gain matrix K, and then you upload it over the air and you would try to fly. Uh, and this worked very well for the quadcopter case. And we tried it here, it was catastrophic. So I had an uh, undergrad student working on this and he just we couldn't get it working. And I kept thinking he's you know he made a programming error or something later. Uh, but when we analyzed the system it turned out that fundamentally this is a bad design. And I'm explain why it's bad. So if you look at this vehicle it clearly has a very low mass number of inertia around the axis that's connecting the two components. Uh, and it has uh, the axis around which you want to rotate is the Z axis and it turns out the mass of inertia around Z is between the two other uh, mass moments of inertia. And what that means is that the system rotating around this axis is unstable. And you can test this if you take your phone. So your phone is a nice object because it's very rectangular. Uh, the principal axes are clear. The smallest mass moment of inertia is around this axis. So if you throw your phone, and I would suggest you bring someone else's phone, this is a new phone, so I'm not <laughs> going to throw it. Uh, my old phone was broken, so I guess why. But if you throw it around this axis, you'll get a very nice rotation. The largest mass moment of inertia is the same. If you throw it around the largest axis, you'll get a very nice rotation. However, if you throw it around the middle axis, which is this axis here, right? So it rotates like this. It is impossible to get a nice single rotation before you catch it. And it's exactly the same problem that we had here. And it turned out for this vehicle, we had an eigenvalue out at plus 35. And what would happen is the moment there was some noise in the system that caused the input to saturate, this eigenvalue takes over and destroys uh, your equilibrium. And this just shows you what happens in real time. So this is time evolving on the x-axis. These are the motion forces when we're flying. So white is flying in closed loop, and then uh, the gray area is when we turned off the controller. So when we turn off the controller, the forces drop to zero. Uh, and you see the angular velocities, which is these nice here, explode. So you see the very clear uh, exponential instability here. So this suggests that this is a terrible vehicle, uh, and that's why we never could get it working. Right? Just fundamentally, it's a bad design. Uh, and I guess the lesson for us here was to look at the system margins as well as this casting the LPR closely by value because here this is a terrible design. We use this lesson then to think about what is the simplest flying vehicle that you can build. And we argue that this is the simplest flying vehicle in existence. 
simplest in the sense that it has only a single moving part. So it has a single propeller rotating about an axis. Uh, and then it has a battery pack, it has some electronics, it has the motion capture markers and some of the balls, but that's it. There's no other inputs, so single input, and there's no other aerodynamic surfaces. So there's no passive aerodynamic vehicle. Effectively, it's a brake to which you tie a propeller. Uh, and this vehicle flies, so this is show you what it looks like when it flies, so as you'd expect, it has to be rotated on its wings, but it can you know, stay in one position. So not only can you hover, you can actually also maneuver around. So you launch the vehicle by throwing it like a frisbee. And then you can sort of control it by using this magic wand here. This just shows that you can actually maneuver it in the world. So it's now tracking a point in space that you point to, and it's going from one point to another. So it's not as agile as a quadcopter is, but it's still able to maneuver around the world quite well. Now clearly, this design is not a brick with the propeller attached to it. Uh, and we spent quite a bit of time thinking about the mass distribution, right? So we learned that the mass distribution is the key. Um, and the way we did this, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but effectively, it's three components that have roughly the same mass. So there's the motor, there's the battery, and there's the electronic stack. And initially, we have all of these on an equilateral triangle. Uh, and then we investigated the robustness of the system as you move one of these components around. So the battery and the propeller are fixed positions, then you move where the electronics are relative to the other two. And you compute how likely it is that in a second of worth of flight, uh, under sort of normal perturbations, how likely is it that the input will saturate? And what we found is that there's a very nice valley where if you put the electronics in this valley, you have very low probability. And then once you leave this valley, uh, the design sort of approaches this terrible design that we had with the two propeller vehicles. So that's why the vehicle looks in this funny shape that it does. This comes from this sort of analysis. Um, we don't know what this vehicle is good for, by the way, except showing that it's possible to fly with a single propeller. Uh, so we don't have a commercial application for this. But there's a very clear commercial application for this design. So on its own, this is a terrible way to fly a vehicle. But once you take two of them and you use them together, you have the standard mass distribution of quadcopter. But at the same time, you suddenly have complete redundancy between the two systems. So if anything fails on the one vehicle, the other vehicle has its own sensors, it has its own battery, and is completely able to fly, carrying effectively the disabled vehicle as a payload uh, back safely to where it started. Uh, so this is something that the Swiss company Various Studios, where I was for about a year, um, exploited to create very safe drones to be used in theater performances. So where was this used? So I'm just going to show you this video. This is from a Cirque du Soleil performance. This was done in New York. It was actually it's the biggest theater in New York's Broadway. The show is not running anymore, unfortunately. Effects in the background on one of these border shows. Um, and Safety Slay was interested in adding more special effects, right? Not just people hanging on ropes being pulled around, but actually having things flying on stage. So, for about one minute of this two hour performance, there are drones that fly. And these drones look like what you see in the video. You think you have everything, but still your heart is questioning. There must be something more. Through this life, now I'm sure. True. And I only have one wish At the end of all of this you. Okay, so sorry for the terrible cutting job there I'm sure this delay is very uh, strict about uh, copyright So I have to cut this from YouTube videos But you see the drones flying And you see the drones are relatively large right? They have to be to be visually impactful uh, on a stage um, and there's no net separating the actors from the drones, nor is there a net separating the audience from the drones, right? Because at the theater, the whole reason you go there is because it's close to uh, the intimacy of the action. Um, and then the argument of having these completely redundant systems was what made the company and Circus May comfortable running this. Uh, and there's eight drones flying like eight times per week, or well, used to be the centuries uh, stop now, but. Uh, in a theater that seats 2,000 people, right? So you have 2,000 people, if you crash, you have to stop the show. That's a large financial impact 
uh, in addition, of course, to the you know, potential injuries that you might face. And in this full mechanical redundancy, it then gives you this confidence uh, for operating in these conditions. So more recent work, thinking about disturbances acting on vehicles, um, you know, not only are you interested in flying where it's not much shooting you, but realistic conditions uh, when you're delivering packages, you might be stuck in storms, something like what you see on this video. It might be very high wind shear environments, so that's just a drone flying in very high winds, uh, or other kinds of disturbances. So we're thinking about what can you do to these systems to make them more robust to these kinds of disturbances. And one of the ideas we're exploring is similar to how satellites stabilize themselves uh, in space, which is using angular momentum. So you don't want the vehicle to be rotating as we had before, because clearly that invalidates putting a camera on it. And also, if you want to carry something somewhere, uh, you might prefer it to come unshaken. Uh, so the idea is to add an external momentum wheel to the vehicle, uh, have this momentum wheel spin at a high rate, and then exploit this for stability. So what these plots show, let me explain these plots. So the x-axis, you see the angular momentum that you store in the wheel, effectively how fast the wheel is spinning. Uh, and then on the, yeah, so the, as a function of how fast the wheel is spinning, you get the angular momentum. And then you can compute how sensitive the system is to these external disturbances as a function of the speed in the wheel. So what this line here is, is it's the H2 norm, so the sensitivity of the system to external impulse torques. Uh, normalized to the normal quad copy case. And what we see is that this magic number, which we chose for angular momentum, uh, we get about a 45% reduction.